All right, so good afternoon. My name is Stacey Stearns. I'm from Yukon Extension, and I'm going to talk to you about data visualization today. So before we get started, are any of you doing data visualization with your programs right now? What are you currently doing with your evaluation data when you gather it? Yes. I don't know if this counts as data visualization, but everyone always wants to create, um, oh, what are they called, the, the infographics. Mm -hmm. So that's like a huge mm -hmm. thing, is the infographic. Okay. We love infographics here at UConn too, so we're with you there. Anybody else? Penn State's just smiling and nodding, so I'm assuming that's a yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so stretched, I, I can't really do much hands-on, but we've been utilizing Qualtrics a lot for just their, their visualization platform. Okay. Um, just because it's, it's really easy for me to, to output. It's built in, it's yeah, right there. It's built in, so I don't have to do much manipulating. Personally, I use Excel a lot for, uh, for data visualization and for reporting. Okay. Um, so I'm well, interested about Canada. Well, you're talking about graphs. Okay, because I actually send pictures to my, like if I get a grant from someone, I actually reply to them with some data and then I give them pictures because the picture is worth about more. Pictures are very important too. So, and all of that can be incorporated in. Anyone else want to share? All right, so let's go for the definition of data visualization. So this is a quote from Canva, might be slightly biased, I didn't see their research, but humans process visual scenes about 60,000 times faster than they do text, and people only read about 28% of the text, which uh, if you ask my student and employee how well I read his three paragraph email yesterday afternoon, not so well. So I think that's pretty accurate, and I think we're all guilty of that at some point in our lives. So the definition of data visualization is information in the form of a chart, diagram, your pictures, anything like that counts as data visualization and then it comes down to how you package it together and what it looks like. So when I started with Extension, we didn't really have um, an annual report or any way to share what we were doing. I started with UConn Extension 2012, I think. Anyway, it's been a while. So my teammate and I, the graphic designer who designed these, Kara Bonzik, decided that we would start creating some visual things with our data. Part of my job description, Allison mentioned that she does the USDA report. All of your universities, I'm sure you're all aware, do the USDA reports. So I had to do all of that with some other teammates. I had all of the data in mishmashes. So Kara and I started, we have, uh, there we go. Oh, it doesn't work on the screen. All right, on your left is our highlights report. So your research stations. At each of your universities, there's a research station. They are federally required to have a highlights report go to the legislature every year. Extension is not. However, our extension director thought it would be good, so that's where we put all of our pictures. And then on the right is our impact sheet, and that's what we, your basic data visualization. That's where we put our charts and our numbers and just some stuff pretty you know, uh, we call it eye candy. It's not really a concrete, but when you give it to the legislators, it immediately, they understand what it means, and they see it, and they're like, oh, this is what you do. So then we also took all of that program data, and we started co collecting it by town. So we're a little bit smaller than Penn State, New York. We only have 169 towns and cities in Connecticut, so we looked at all of our programs, and we found out that 4-H is in 168 of 169 towns. And our soil test is, got to work on Beacon Falls, tell Peggy. Our 4-H program is, uh, or our soil test program is in all 169 towns. So basically we collected all of that up and we made this map and we color coded it for our legislator. So these are just some of the things that we decided to do for data visualization. And our primary audience when we started was our Yukon administrators and our legislator because we're a small state, policy matters, as you guys all understand, funding. On the Beacon Falls thing, I'm just wondering, I do, there are a couple of kids who are new members, so okay. I'll update, so you're good. All right, well, yeah. were they like members on December 31st? Because Noah is sitting in my office right now updating numbers, and we can text Appreciate him it, yeah. and get them right in so that we can get you guys to 169. We're Nanawag students, and Nanawag is starting a 4-H club. Okay. Library, and it, a lot of New Haven County kids are gravitating to that in our poultry club. So I know we have people. Clubs. That's awesome because he and I, when we did his orientation, yeah. so there's a lot of student work that goes into these things in Excel. So yeah. 
You and I are going to talk afterwards. This is good. So, sorry, everyone else. Thank you. Well, we haven't looked at the rest of your data yet, so he's working through. But that was your uh, 2017 numbers. You were missing Beacon Falls. Um, so our 4-H Common Measures team, Mariah, Mary Ann, Jen, they created their own impact sheet. And you might want to do this or consider doing it for your own 4-H programs in your state. It's an easy way to just pull out your program. You can do it for your county level, for your state level. Again, it's just a one-page thing, could be more, that you give to your key stakeholders and show them what you're doing with your programs. So here are some examples of data visualization. So on the left is our 4-H numbers from 2018. And then on the right is our volunteer numbers from 2017. So you can see how we've sort of evolved. We started being more visual, a little bit less text, trying to play with it a little bit as we've gotten feedback from our audiences. Now, if you look, this is the 2019 data with the 4-H. Again, we went for it a little bit differently. We added in the header this year. We kind of tried to clean it up and simplify it up a little bit more. So basically, this is a professional designer doing that. I'm not a professional designer, but it evolves even with the professionals. So you just start somewhere, and then you continue growing and improving on it year by year. Here's another example. This is one of our earliest data visualizations that we did for our hours of instruction. You can see it's really heavy on the text, but that clock gives you a quick idea, just a basic glance on it. You know it's something about hours, and you decide whether you wanted to read that text or not. This is one of the ways we decided to visualize our qualitative data. So we had all these participant quotes. And basically, when we do that impact sheet, we're looking at the higher level numbers, the total number of 4-H. You know, we're not drilling down very deep, but we had some quotes that really meant something to about how the program, and they kind of gave you a little bit more information on <coughs> those participants. So we decided to do the text bubbles and our little animated people. We're trying to get away from cheesier graphics. That's our new goal from this year, was moving away from our cheesy infographics. This is an older version of Citizens Engage. You can see that we have the clover or the person showing that each one of those equals 1,000. There's always got to be that legend. So this is a basic bar graph, but we decided to just show it in a different format. We used the little people and the clovers just to change it up a little, show the data differently. Again, these are some of our older ones. The top one shows the number of states using our Rain Garden app, and the bottom one shows the number of people trained in our Land Use Academy and our Tree Warden Academy looking for fun ways to show the data with a little bit of text. So you may be thinking, help, I'm not a designer. Neither am I. I had a designer helping me with that. But Canva is the great equalizer because it takes people like you and me who don't have design talent, and it lets us do these on our own because we're all stretched thin and we don't have access to designers. So with Canva, you basically, it's an online platform, it's a free software, you can pay for the professional version, but basically, and I can't use my pointer. You can actually pay for also pictures individually. Yes, you can just pay the dollar to just use this ra one random photo. Um, so there's a lot of options in it, but there's templates, you can see the templates over here, templates down there, you can search, you can create anything you want. There's the pro version, there's the free version. Most of us are using the free version still, and what I'm gonna show you today was all done in the free version because we understand budgets. But there's some basic principles of design, we'll go over those, and then in the later part of the workshop, what we're gonna let you do is just kinda hop on your laptops, or you're already on your laptops, and work on some designs yourself with the data that you have, or the group in the back, just keep making up numbers, that's what I did for. <laughs> That's what I did for the examples in the slideshow. I was uh, sitting there and I'm like, oh, I could go find some numbers or I could just make some up and it works. I like it. All right, so design thinking. So you want to start with that and it's empathy, experimentation, and expansive thinking. So empathy means your user is your focus. Expansive thinking is brainstorming. There are many ways to get to the, a solution. You know, there's multiple right answers, and you guys are 4-H agents, educators, however you're termed, so you totally get that. 
and then experiment, which ideas work and which ideas don't. You saw our long list of experiments that we've done over the years, just trying to get to that same place. So it, just a work in progress, have fun with it. So how you communicate your data. You need to develop a style and stay consistent. So I showed you all those examples from our impact sheet. Yes, we evolved and changed over time, but you can pretty much tell that it was the same document, the same type of thing. It needs to be tailored for any situation. So our target audience is our legislators, but we also understand that a 4-H parent might be pick, picking it up at the Hartford County office or that the master gardeners may happen to see it. It's going to have a lot of different people seeing it. So despite the fact that legislators are our target audience and our administrators, we want anybody who picks it up to be able to understand it. You need to create a plan. Before we start designing, we always have a plan. We know what our key numbers are that we want to share that year. Uh, that comes from our administrators. For those of you who are doing this for your program, you can create that plan yourself. It needs to be easy to understand. So we'll go back to that clock example. It was kind of cool looking, but in the grand scheme of things, unless you read all of that text, it wasn't really that easy to understand. So that's how the evolution occurs, and sometimes you have to learn those lessons the hard way. It should be persuasive. So in our case, we are using our data visualizations to convince people of the value of our programs, to show our impact, Whatever your goal is, you want to be persuasive and you want to be able to back that up. Your data, you want to back your data up with your visualization. Be creative and then don't be afraid to ask a question with your visualization. So we'll show you some examples later on, but it could be that you're trying to get more people to join 4-H or you're trying to get more people to incorporate better hand washing practices in their homes, you can ask that question through your data visualization. So there's a lot of questions to ask when you are starting uh, your pro project, um, and you all have a handout and I have extras if you don't, but the purpose of your design, the one key takeaway, who is your audience, in what context are they going to see it, in what medium. So you want to think about these things ahead of time. I'd like to answer those questions before we start. So is it going to be a fact sheet? Is it going to be a social media post? Is it going to be a poster in the legislative office building? Knowing that ahead of time really helps you to formulate your design because if you just start designing first and then <coughs> think about your medium, you're going to spend a lot of extra time working on it. And then I don't think I said it in the previous slide, but one of the key things that my designer always tells me, and the, the more I do designs on my own, the more I realize, you start early. Give yourself plenty of time, and I know time is a premium, but even if you just carve out 20 minutes a day to play with it, it helps. So you want to pick your dimensions. Use the existing templates that are available in Canva. Customize, balance, and use negative space. So this is all part of the design thinking. And if you use the templates that are available, instead of starting from scratch, many of these will be taken care of. It will already have the balance in it. It'll already use the negative space if you just customize one of those templates with your data and find the right one. And that makes it a lot easier. So for the best management practices, we've got fonts, shapes, icons, and illustrations, color palettes, you want to limit your text, organize your content, keep it simple, get inspired, and ask for feedback. And that's a long list, and you can grab these off of the um, share drive, the Google Drive, but we'll go through each of them individually. So on the fonts, no more than two fonts on a design. I think we've all seen the poster at your 4-H educators. You have probably seen these at your fair or from your youth where you mix up a lot of different fonts and it just doesn't work. You want to stick with your two fonts. They should complement each other. Uh, don't just settle for the first two that you find. Um, all of your designs have the standard ones that are in there. If you're using that template, you can probably settle. But if you're creating from scratch, don't start with the defaults and just stay with it. Uh, there's 
you can adjust the weight of one of your fonts. So use that bold. Use your font increase. Um, use your heading text. And then your font size, style, and placement lead your viewer through your graphics. So you want to be able to use where your text is in your visualization to take your viewer from one point to the next so that you tell your story in your visualization. And if you're confused about that, Canva has a font pairing guide, which um, you know, Mariah likes to nerd out about numbers. There's those of us that nerd out about color palettes and font pairings, and there's all sorts of different fun things you can do in your free time on a random evening when you don't want to do what the work you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> So here's another example from this year's data visualization that really kind of shows you the fonts. We've got the two fonts, the one for the numbers, and we went with more text this year because we needed to tell the story a little bit differently, but we used one text for the key quantitative numbers, and then the second font was for our qualitative numbers. We used the um, font styling to just sort of pop those numbers a little bit more so if they don't read all the text, they get the key things, and we added the heading in. So your shapes, icons, and illustrations, again, they can be used to help take the eye of your viewer to the key point. So here is an example from Canva where they use that transparent rectangle to just bring their font and their key message forward in the uh, design. You can upload your own, you can use the free stock choices, you can pay the dollar for whatever font, uh, shape, icon, or illustration you want. There's over two million different photos in Canva, so you should be able to find what you need. The other option is you can go on a Google image search. You guys all use the image search and search for reuse with modification. So when I can't find something I want, I always use that one. So on your color palettes, you want three to four colors maximum. Um, you need to pick your first color. In your case, it will probably be 4-H green. And then you want to complement your color based off of that. That color should convey emotion. I know a lot of us, we use Pantone 289C, which is navy blue, a lot at UConn because that is our key color for Yukon colors. So whatever your color is for your university, you may end up pairing that with your 4-H green. And I think I wrote down your RGB. Um, I have it somewhere, but I can give you the RGB if you don't have it for 4-H green so that you can easily find it and then pair it. And the good news on green is that it's a trending color this year with Canva, so those natural colors are in, so you will be on point with whatever you're designing. So here's a basic chart example that was made in Canva. You could also take your chart from Excel, import it right into Canva if you're more comfortable in that platform, or you can build the chart within Canva, pop your number in. I made these numbers up, but it says clubs, local fairs, projects at home, community service. Gives you the number of youth. It's very basic, shows people what you want. Talked about infographics, so I literally took the free template infographic on healthy living out of Canva, and all I did was change the shade of green from the lime green to the 4-H green, and that's exactly how it came out of Canva. So if you only changed one thing and put your own data in, you get that pretty simply out of Canva. And these are the actual infographics out of it pulled out. So again, those are built right into Canva, those kind of the pie charts and the bar graph. You just put your own numbers in and the, the platform populates it for you. This is an, another example from Canva that, so the design principle is to limit text and as you can see, at Yukon Extension, sometimes we do it well, sometimes not so well. But I really like this example from Canva because just by looking at it briefly, you can tell by the light bulbs and the <coughs> drops of water that they're decreasing the amount of electricity used and increasing water savings. You don't have to read all of the text to convey that message. So you can do the same thing. I did it with your 4-H Clover, showing a 25% increase just by playing with the size of your clover. But if you spend a couple extra minutes on the design and just take some time and get a little more creative, you add that transparent box and your border, 
So this is why you want to experiment and take your time because it's, you see the difference. That's like, eh, that's okay. But just adding a couple design features really helps to make it pop a little bit more. So just experiment and you can always in Canva revert back to a previous version if you don't like what you've done. That undo button is our friend. So here's an example of a social media post. For some of your audiences, your parents may be on Facebook, you know, depending on who your target audience is for the data that you're trying to visualize for your 4-H program, you'll want to go in a different place. So in this version, we have our data point is really small up here at the top, the 68%, because we're really just hammering home the grow with 4-H and the number is a little bit more of the afterthought in this one. But, oh, they're out of order. So we'll get to the other version at some point. But in this poster example, um, and again, this is a Canva template. All I, I didn't even change the colors on this one. So we've got the 77% is your data point. It's buried here a little bit because we want to convey that they have a, youth have a brighter future because of their 4-H involvement. And then the one thing you're probably also noticing is your brand should be, so your university logo, I put the common measures one on all of these because this presentation was originally given at NEA 4-H-A. Um, apologize to New Jersey for your new acronym. I did see that in the ECOP Monday Minute, but I don't know the new acronym yet. So um, you always want to make sure your brand is on there. And I use the general 4-H.org website, of, obviously for your states you would put in your 4-H website or wherever you're sending them to to join. So here's another one of our social media post examples, and this time the data point is the key thing. So again, you're thinking about your audience, what becomes your key, your key message depends on who your audience is and what action you're trying to get them to take. So for the communication people, one thing that, um, no, I think I've told Mary Ellen this, is one of the 4-H people was in my office, oh, it was Mary Ann. So when we're trying to tell our story, we have a really simple model that the communication people give to all of you. Um, and you saw Allison's impact sheet. We call it PAC in communications, problem, action, change. So we want you to tell us what the problem was, the action that you had for 4-H and the change as a result. So when you're writing your 4-H stories, so you can also use PAC when you're thinking about your data visualizations, you want to show that pack through the visualization. So what was your problem, what action happened, and the change. And then it's just kind of a fun and easy acronym to remember. So this is another example from Canva. The time, yes, Bill? I'm sorry. I just, um, oh, no, it's all good. Anybody can ask questions no, anytime. The poster thing, like, which I know we'll probably learn this in a minute, but when that happens, you create it as a save, as a JPEG that you can print out and then use, or get big, like, yes. how do you get it from this program? How does it save so you can do it, do like a whatever? So Canva defaults to whatever medium they think you should have, but you can tell them what you want to have instead. So, <coughs> um, you no, it's all good. This is about what you guys need. So here's Jen Nadeau's, uh, actually it all happened earlier this week. So it's all done, Jen has her flyer, it's all made, and now we want to download it. So I say I want to download it. Canva's telling me I should take a PDF, but I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna put this on Facebook or Twitter. I want a JPEG, you tell it what you want, okay, so and then you just hit download, it gives you this little inspirational quote as you're going along. <laughs> Keeps you entertained, tells me I should be printing it with them and spending all my money at Canva, and we all go home. But you can kind of mess around with it and get whatever you want out of Canva. It will default to what it thinks you need. It's not necessarily always right, so you can tell it what you actually need instead. And then, like, if it saves it as a, because, like, I use Publisher a lot uh -huh. in my former world, and I still go to that. But then whenever you start putting pictures in, it's huge, and you can't email it to people, so you PDF it. Right. It doesn't do anything with the quality, so it's the same kind of thing. Right. Yeah, so if we look at that file, that JPEG, if 
I can find it again. It came out at 649 kilobytes. So that's an easy thing you can pop into an email, send to anybody, and you're not going to blow up their inbox or get the Microsoft undeliverable, you're spamming the world. It looks, it's pretty clear at that. Yep. Yep, that one. So if we open it. And that picture, when I imported that picture of that horse, I pulled that horse off of Yukon Media Share. It's one of Sean's photos. That was a six millibyte, megabyte photo when I pulled it off Media Share. And Canva just smushed it down automatically for me. I had to do nothing. And so when I gave it to Jen, it was down to a 700 kilobyte file. So she could just put it wherever she wanted it to be. And And so I can. The pro, so it's $9.95 if you pay it annually, if you, you know, do the lump sum payment at the $9.95 a month. Yep. So it's like, what, $120 a year. Or if you want to pay in the monthly installments, it's $12.95 doing that. And then if you guys are in regular old Canva and you say you want to do a report and you look at the templates, so if you just hover over them at the bottom, you see where it says free. <laughs> That one just says one of three, at the, so you know you have to pay for it. One of three, there's a free one, it's the same free one. So you can look before you get too far into your design. And I've done the exact same thing with the pro version ones and screenshotted them because I'm like, I really just want that design and I'm not giving you your 9.95 this month. So, yes. Yeah, you don't get the bigger quality with it that way. All right, so let's go back. And we're going to speed up a little bit so that we can uh, give you guys some time to play with it. So again, this is just showing a timeline. If you're doing progress in your programs year over year, this might be a really effective way. Um, we talked about doing this. We haven't done it yet, but we're still working on the other version of our 2019 data, we had a 25% increase in the number of volunteer hours across all of our extension programs from 2018 to 2019. So we were talking about doing one of these types of visualizations to show that. So I'm sure you all have, um, Jen has had incredible increases in enrollment in Hartford County 4-H. So she might want to show a timeline. There's a whole lot of different ways to show timeline type data with your visualizations. And again, there's all those free templates. So consistency matters. And this is one thing that my uh, graphic designer yells at me a lot about because I get ideas. And I'm like, oh, we could do this and we could do that. And, but you have to stick with your brand. You have to stick, be consistent because people start to have a certain look and feel with your data that they expect to see from you. And when you, they pick up something from your office, one of your data visualizations, you want them to know at first glance, in that first two seconds, that it is from your program. So you want to keep it simple, get inspired, so look at all those other things, but stay consistent throughout. And then again, you want to ask for that feedback and keep growing and improving. So we got the feedback, and I sort of saw the progression from our earlier designs to some of the later ones, how we've tried to change it and grow. So there's a lot of resources out there. A lot of these are on Canva. Um, and there is a caveat. There are a ton of these. So you don't necessarily have to stay with Canva. I, don't, I haven't used any of these. Canva is just my personal preference. But you can use Data Wrapper, Charted. And these are all in the notes section of my slides on um, the Google Drive. It's whatever slide we're on. Slide 33, there's the list. Um, Chart Studio, Fast Charts, Palladio is for historical designs. Open Heat Map is spreadsheets with a heat map. So if you want to take your map a step higher than we took with, with our map of uh, towns, there's, I'm sure there's other choices. Those are the ones that I found. And all of these different resources, um, if you Google any of that, like Canva, how to design infographics, it'll pop right up. If you really want to get into it, Canva has a free design school. Um, there's like a minute 44, two minute type video with each lesson. And then there's these little activities you can do. And there's four or five different courses. So depending on how interested you get in data visualization, that is available for you. So what I thought we could do is you can either work in small groups, you can work on your own. Go to canva.com. So you have your worksheet. 
So let's take that, answer your questions with either some of your current data. We can make up the data with our 80% in the back row. Um, I had and then the other thing I'm seeing in my notes that I didn't mention is color contrast analyzer. So Marianne, I'm going to totally call out your county, but it's not your fault because Kevin designed it. We had a 4-H brochure designed years ago that was beautiful with 4-H green and orange text. And Marianne had a volunteer sitting in her table at her office, Mark, and he picks it up and he's like, this is great. You know, I'm colorblind and I have no idea what this says right now because orange on um, green doesn't work. So there's a couple tools. I like web, and if you go to slide 21, but it's web, I'll write it up here, webaim.com or the color contrast analyzer, you can build right into your Chrome so that you can just check. And that's um, ADA compliance too. We have to do it. So um, it's also in those notes. But after Mark said that, it was like, oh, great. We need to throw out a 1,000 brochures and reorder. And then we let that graphic designer know, never do that again. Just it's one of those things, too, you might want to, like, I know that navy blue for Yukon is Pantone 289C. You might want to just memorize your 4-H green RGB. Um, it's on one of these note slides. Can you put it in MPMS? Uh, you might be able to. Yeah. 347? Uh, that's the Pantone color. Wait a minute, you know what? It's 33.99.66. 33.99.66. There it goes, 4-H green. So then you just click on it. Thank you very much. So, like these great little pins right here that I'm wearing, we got them printed or whatever, manufactured, whatever, ha however it happens. And my buddy Tom did it, and he was a registered Yukon vendor and he didn't bother to send this design to, and he did it, I mean, the vendor designed it. He didn't send it to Yukon for um, verification, and Kyle, our uh, trademark and copyright fellow, who luckily is a friend, calls me, and he says, don't use Tom anymore. He's my friend too, but your pins that you now have a 1,000 of are non-compliant. I'm like, oh, I'll give them to the Master Gardener volunteers, Kyle. It'll be all good. But they were going through our rebranding, and so they'd done the new word mark, which is on your folder and everything. It's on the top of your notebook, that Yukon in capital letters. But they hadn't decided yet how to put everything underneath it. And we had a group of volunteers going to DC. And our department had said, I need pins. So I called Tom. And I'm like, make me some pins. But yeah, our university, all designs, um, before they go out the door, go through. So you have to work within your university regulations and if they won't let you use the green can you use your clover yeah i think so i was just told because i put out a newsletter for my county and i used the green for everything and then someone's like mm, mm, no you have to use the blue and the gray and the white that goes back to the consistent universe so the and it's really hard for all of our programs that you know we're three four five layers removed from the overall university but the university is going for that same consistent thing of when somebody picks it up, they want you to know that it's you, Maine. And then the program ends up getting buried a little yeah. bit. So your job is to find other ways to bring out your program brand. Um, I know our 4-H program has worked really hard to rebrand themselves as UConn 4-H. They used to be known as Connecticut 4-H. And you guys have like incorporated the clover in with the word mark with the correct placement away so that it didn't look like you were modifying the logo. Um, but that's where that experimentation and taking some time. And then once you find what works, you know, if you can, what's you mean's colors? You're like a navy bluish and a gray too, yeah, aren't it's you? Like light blue, a darker blue, and oh, yeah, blue you got that nice gray. sky blue, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you know, if you figure out, and can you? There is an official University of Maine graphic extension for a heading. Yeah. With the clover on it, which is good. So you might, 
ask them. Let me show you if I can wake this thing back up. So we've got here sneak preview, <laughs> but you could do something like see just that green accent line on the bottom of your blues. Ask them if you're allowed to do something like that instead so that you can incorporate in your 4-H green without breaking any of their rules. So can you use just an accent color? And then, you know, work with the, they don't want to be mean. Kyle, our brand police for lack of better words, he's just doing his job. The president's office has said, you keep everybody in line. So if you talk to them and say, I need to do X, Y, Z for my program, they'll help you find those creative solutions because there's more than one right answer for everything. And here's the Yukon 4-H team's impact sheet. They've got the Yukon blue here, but they put the 4-H green right next to it. So that's another way of creatively, here Yukon, here's your blue, here's your brand, but we are also 4-H. So if you experiment with a bunch of different and ask them, you know, set up an appointment and go sit in their office and say, okay, you want this and I want this. How can we get to it? Yeah. So like that, both those little guys are national 4-H stock photos. That girl is a stock photo. That's a 4-H stock photo. The 4-H stock photos are really good, right? Yeah. The problem with it, we've used a ton of the 4-H stock photos. Um, I don't know if I have my impact sheet from last year somewhere, but there's the little girl with the vegetables. So there's some really good ones. If you sign into 4-H Media, you can get some good stock photos. If you go to a site like, um, oh, no, I like that little girl too, but uh, no, 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 these are from National 4-H. It's the little girl that's on the cover of highlights. Hang on, I got highlights up. Um, she's adorable. But uh, then I was at NEA 4HA, and I'm like, everyone's using my kid. Well, that's because she's a 4H stock photo. It's not really mine. It's actually theirs. But that little girl right there, love her. And then I saw her everywhere when I went to NEA 4HA, and I'm like, oh, yeah, everyone's using that same photo because we all love that kid. Um, so there's a lot of your younger generations, Gen Z is really, and so your audience is really caught on to stock photos and they get when it's not authentic. So your stock photos that you're gonna find, even the free ones when you go to um, Shutterstock or you download any of those free ones, the ones that look too perfect, they generally, you're gonna, your audience is going to see through that. What may be better, and Marianne mentioned it, I take all my own photos. If you take a day, a year, Please take more than that. But, you know, if you take a couple times, you know, once quarterly maybe, and you schedule a photo shoot and you set up your photos. So Maryland has the advantage of having Edwin Remsburg on retainer. And Edwin just goes out a few times a year and takes out Maine. You guys do too. He takes all of your photos in Alaska and uh, Georgia. But... But, you know, basically you get a professional photographer and you say, we know we need 4-H pictures, we know we need farm pictures, we know, and you want somebody here with steam, so you want to get the kids working with their robotics. So you just basically go and schedule some of these photos, get a higher quality photo, get a, you know, get a photographer to go in or invest in the higher quality uh, camera. The thing with your iPhones now or any of your Androids, actually my mother's Android takes better phones, so, and Edwin or Mike or any of your professional photographers will tell you this too, is that the quality of your cell phone camera is increasing enough now that you can get pretty high quality photos off of it. So you need to just think about that design again when you're taking your photos instead of using stock photos. So how many times do you see an image it's centered, okay, well don't look at those that we chose to use. But you know, if you put your subject to your left or your right, if you take a different angle, if you take a few minutes to set up that photo, the stock photos are good. I think he's falling asleep. Stock photos are good, um, but you know, that's, a, so these two are stock photos, but everything else, these are our own photos. The two 4-H ones are stock photos. 
Um, but the first one and three, four, and five are all photos that we took at different events. So we knew that Dave was going to be out in the Fenton River woods in the stream with this group of kids. So we sent Kara, one of our photographers, graphic designers, and she followed him around for the day and took pictures. We knew that they were doing a necropsy in the lab. So we sent one of the photographers over to our medical diagnostic lab and just said, get a whole bunch of photos of them working in the lab. So this is our turf field day. We have a photographer on site the entire day. And I've got a, so I show horses and ride endurance. So one of my friends is a horse show photographer and he'll take in a 10 minute class, maybe a thousand to 3000 photos for each class between him and his other photographer. And how he says that for every hundred photos he takes, he keeps one, throws the other 99 out. And that's what, when I go back to his trailer after the class to look at what there is, you only see those 300 photos from the class that made the cut or 30 or whatever his math is. So you got to be ruthless in throwing them away and be ruthless with your stock photos too.